Uh, folks, again, welcome. We have with us Congressman Steve King. Congressman King is a member of the Judiciary Committee. He's also a member of the Small Business Committee. Um, he is one of those people in Washington that we can always count on to, to stand up for what is right and to, to be a voice sometimes crying in the wilderness. Uh, I'll let him tell you anything else that he wants to tell you about what he's doing. Congressman King, thank you so much again for taking time to join us. The floor is yours, sir. Well, thank you very much, Reverend. I appreciate the privilege to have this conversation today. And, uh, you know, all the things that we do, our prayers and, and the words we say and the work we do and the examples that we set, um, all, if done correctly, move this thing in the right direction. And it's part of our duty and our responsibility. Um, I think that, uh, you know, a couple of the topics that we we decided to discuss um, were about the immigration circumstances and especially the children uh, down on the southern border, and then the situation of the VA. And uh, what I'd like to do is um, address the VA first and then go to the immigration side of this thing. Um, and that's, uh, that's a topic that I think might take a little bit longer. But with the, with the VA, I've made a number of public statements on this that I'm likely to repeat here. Uh, but among them are that the, the VA is a government-run health care system, and it's established for our veterans, uh, the, the many of them wounded veterans, so um, Purple Heart recipients, the most revered of American citizens, and we're taking care of them with a health care program that's, that's designed for them, specifically for them, because they have special health care requirements, uh, that it requires a high degree of specialization in many of them, the prosthetics that uh, we're producing now because of the IEDs that we've faced for over, well over a decade. And so if we have a government-run health care system that's designed for the most revered of Americans and specialized to a degree to deal with their specific injuries, and we can't deliver an adequate health care to them that the average wait time was published here, I think, yesterday, 90 or 91 days, the, the average wait time for someone to see a doctor or a specialist or get an appointment with a VA system, that's terrible. It's abysmal. It's disrespectful. And how it could erode to that point and escape the notice of the many veterans they have working within the VA, um, I don't know how to answer that except that there, there's a lot of union involvement that writes up rules that keeps the reform from actually happening. And that and just uh, an administration that hasn't been run from a competent, competent perspective I'll say from the White House on down, and I've noticed this change. And it doesn't mean that these problems didn't exist before the president we have. They did. Uh, in fact, it looks like some of them began back under the previous administration. But they're dealing with, with a government-run health care system that continually writes rules for the whole country that aren't tied to the, to the restraints that free enterprise puts in place. If you're operating a business for profit, there are naturally a lot of things that you must do uh, that that provide for uh, better service if you're going to stay in business because competition will do them if you do not. Um, and I've spent 28 years in the private sector, and I know what happens if we don't have modern equipment, if we don't have uh, we, we don't improve our productivity. The competition will do that, and they'll bid us out of work, and we'll be sitting there a has-been company rather than a cutting-edge competing company. That's also true in healthcare, and. And yet there are many good health care providers in, within the VA system, and uh, we should not disparage the doctors and the nurses and the providers, but instead it's the, it's the problem within the administration, within the structure of the union, and the inability to clean out some of the dead wood and punish the people that have been so wrong in falsifying records. And there's something that was in place that was, a, um, that was in the culture that, that bred that kind of thinking. So what I've been for for a long time, and I'd say probably 10 years, is give our veterans a card, a plastic card like a credit card, uh, one that honors them in their service. Uh, let them uh, show up at any health care provider and uh, receive that service if they choose to go to VA clinics and choose to go to VA hospitals because of the specialty nature of the care there. Good. I would encourage them to do that. Uh, but it, it, that's how we end the lines. They don't have to wait in line any longer And with that kind of a system. We owe that to them. And we should remember also that when dealing with our veterans, uh, there was whatever the agreement was when they signed up, when they entered the military, 
if that agreement was for uh, uh, health care under certain conditions for life, that's what it is. We can't change the deal. Uh, they committed and they risked their lives, and, and many of them, when they committed that, lost their lives on the, on, on the promise of the federal government. And if we can't keep a promise to our veterans, who could we keep a promise to? Uh, so I'd give them the card, and I'd remind people that what we see in the VA system today is what we will see in Obamacare if we're not successful in fully repealing it and ripping it out by the roots. So Obamacare has become a malignant tumor that is metastasizing, and it feeds off of God-given American liberty. And so if we're going to be the country that uh, has an ascending destiny rather than a descending destiny, uh, we've got to put in more free enterprise, more competition. We've got to eradicate uh, the socialist elements that that feast off of the God-given American liberty. That's the uh, that's the VA piece uh, for me. And uh, then on the immigration side of this, what's going on in, in especially Texas and Arizona, uh, it, it is a human tragedy, and it's a human tra tragedy that is born out of the actions and inaction of the President of the United States. It's rooted clear back in 1986 when Ronald Reagan signed the Amnesty Act. And that was the day that in my construction office where we were just moving dirt and laying pipe every day for a little concrete, um, watching the news and reading, they, when I, I believed all along in the buildup that Ronald Reagan would veto the Amnesty Act because he would understand that when you reward people for breaking the law, you get more law breakers. And the promise to enforce the law would be a very difficult one to keep. Reagan had every intention of keeping the enforce of enforcing the law after 86. He didn't have the cooperation. Both sides didn't believe in it. One side believed in eroding the rule of law and rewarding law breakers. And so what they got was amnesty, not for one million people, but for three million. And they didn't get the enforcement that was the other part of the deal. You know, it was a similar agreement that came about in uh, Bush 41's administration, H. W. George H. W. Bush, um, when he said in 92, read my lips, no new taxes. And then he accepted the new taxes in exchange for the, for the spending cuts that never came. Reagan accepted the amnesty in exchange for the enforcement that never came. Bush 41 accepted the, the tax increase in exchange for the spending cuts that never came. And so now we are here with the rule of law having been eroded since 1986. We had a significant debate on immigration in 2006 or so with major demonstrations here in D.C. and different places around the country. And in the, at the center of this is the law. Are we going to respect the rule of law? And whatever our hearts say to us, we need to remember that we can't be a nation if we don't have borders. Um, the most successful institutions in the last two centuries have been the nation state. And without the nation state, then we have, we have anarchy and chaos globally. And each nation needs to be able to control where the, the, who comes into the country and who stays in the country. In fact, there's some, uh, some language in... Uh, in uh, St. Paul's sermon at Mars Hill, where I see Acts 17, where he says, and God made all nations on earth, and he decided when and where each nation would be. Now, that's one interpretation. You have to look through a few Bibles to find that one. Um, then, uh, so, but I believe in the sovereign nation state. I believe that God gave us this country. He shaped it with the hands of the founding fathers, whom he moved around like men on a chessboard, to build this nation, and we need to respect it and revere it and restore this country to its true destiny. That means we have to secure our borders. We have to restore the rule of law. We can't be rewarding people for breaking it. Now, that's, that's all pretty clear, and it's fundamentally, philosophically, and I think faithfully sound. Now I look at the pictures of these thousands of kids who have been drawn into the United States by actions, um, by the words and actions of the president many of them unlawful, um, this is the direct result of the president's DACA program, his, his deferred action for chi childhood or children aliens. And uh, I declare it to be deferred action for criminal aliens because each one of them that came across the border illegally committed the crime of unlawful entry into the United States. Um, 
when you advertise that you're not going to deport anybody, and then you follow through on that, and people coming into the United States know that this administration will not remove them, then they believe that if they can get into America, they get to stay in America. And that's generally true. And there's plenty of dialogue out there and testimony that says that unless you commit a serious crime, and that's a crime that's serious to the president, not necessarily serious to Congress or the law, they're not going to be deported. Um, that, so this flood of humanity has poured up here, partly in anticipation of an amnesty act that would be this, that's already been bait that's been put out by the Senate Gang of Eight bill. And so the president's deferred action for childhood arrivals is what it is. Um, he wouldn't use the word alien. Um, that has been that has been a, a magnet that's attracted them. I have brought three pieces of legislation to the floor of the House in the last year, two of them just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, one of them bans federal funding uh, to enforce DACA, and that would shut down the, um, the amnesty program that he's implemented there. Um, one of them directs the Department of Justice to investigate the Department of Homeland Security for releasing tens of thousands of felons onto the streets of America, including murderers, rapists, arsonists, and uh, violent criminals of other types. And so that's $5 million dedicated to directing justice to investigate Homeland Security for that. And another one is an amendment that shuts off federal funds that would be going uh, to cities who are sanctuary cities, these cities that have, have passed ordinances that direct their law enforcement officers to refuse to cooperate with federal immigration authorities. You must have cooperation between all levels of law enforcement in any city, or any state for that matter, that refuses to allow its law enforcement officers to cooperate with federal officers should not be receiving federal subsidies uh, going into their cities. So that's three things that I've brought with within uh, well, the, the DACA piece was, not, it was last July or so, I believe, in last year's appropriation bill. And it didn't make law because the Senate blocked it, and these two just two weeks ago. Um, now to deal with the children that are there, the thousands of children, many of them, the thousands of unaccompanied uh, minors is how they are referred to by the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, that number just a little over a year ago, looking back, was a number someplace between six and 8,000, if I remember correctly, for an entire year. I remember sitting down with Chris Crane, the president of the ICE union, about a year ago, and he said, we're going to see 60,000 come into the United States next year. That's the result of these policies. And that number 60,000 has been met or exceeded, and now you see a predicted number that goes, and that goes, the, the White House has predicted 90,000 in a year. Uh, others have predicted 120,000 or more uh, of uh, unaccompanied minors as young as three years old. Now, some of these unaccompanied minors are 17 years and 300 days old. Um, it, they ne didn't necessarily submit to their parents' directions and go into the United States unaccompanied. A lot of them did that on their own. Some of them are smuggling drugs. It's a significant number uh, that, are, that are smuggling drugs into the United States, and I don't mean to allude that it's a majority. It's not. Uh, but this humanitarian crisis that we have needs to be dealt with in a humanitarian way um, with a, a gentle hand on especially the youngest of these children. But these children need to be repatriated into their back to their home countries. If we fail to do that, then we have opened the door for all who might come to America from those countries and be able to get into America would get to stay. This is a trickle. This 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 human thing that some people call the human flood is a trickle compared to what would happen if we fail to repatriate the people that are coming into the United States illegally. We'll have all the migratory population in Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua um, coming into the United States if we don't enforce the border. Mm -hmm. So I'm suggesting this, that we say to the governments of those countries, it's your job to repatriate your children. And uh, we can bring some of them to you. In fact, we may need to bring all of them to you. But you need to care for them in their countries, and you need to get them back to their families in their countries. Family reunions don't always have to take place inside the United States of America. And we cannot have ICE 
completing the crime of delivering illegal aliens that have been smuggled into America, if they intercept them before they arrive at their destination, ICE has, and has picked them up and delivered them to their destination by completing the human smuggling crime. That is appalling to me. It's breathtaking to me. And so that's uh, that's kind of a rundown of okay. what's on my mind, and I think I ran past my 10 minutes of dialogue that, here. That's, I'll pause that's there quite all right. <laughs> that's quite all right, Congressman King. We, this is important information. We needed to hear it. Uh, let me ask the first question, and we'll go to other callers. Um, go back to the VA situation. Now, I've heard that there's already a, a voucher system in operation so that if a veteran cannot get treatment at the VA, uh, he or she can be given a voucher. But now we're being told that legislation is necessary, which is true. I think, and, I, and I've not read the language, but the information that comes to me is that there is a limited availability of voucher under certain circumstances. And if we're going to broaden it enough to cover the people that the mass of veterans that are in line, we may have to address it legislatively. And and then uh, let's see. Then another thing, of course, that we tried to do here in the House is pass a piece of legislation that would allow uh, allow the VA to fire people who have uh, let's say who have who have violated either the law or violated the the system itself by by falsifying records, the Senate blocked that language. So that's there's so there's two pieces of that floating out there. I'm I, I can't say definitively that Congress has to act to deliver the voucher system, but if it's the right thing to do, it shouldn't be difficult for mm-hmm. Congress to act. And I think press, pressing Congress um, to get our veterans a, a a credit card that lets them use that anywhere. Uh, it is it is available on a limited basis. I understand. I don't know what statutory limits there might be, but pressing Congress to act on this is, I think, a good idea, and I would encourage it. Do you think there will be criminal charges against people in the VA? Do you think that's where this is going to ultimately lead, I guess, court charges for fraud um, or, so, or something of that nature? I know there seems to be bi- a bipartisan push, at least for criminal investigation. Well, if they continue to push in that fashion, and that there, that does... Um, Seem, seem to be a bipartisan push on it. I, I, I think there's a chance there could be criminal charges brought, uh, but this, you know, this administration has not done a very good job of investigating itself. And uh, so we'll see where that goes if there's not cooperation between the Department of Justice and uh, investigating the VA, then I think Congress needs to push hard and to act. And I don't think this administration wants another select committee uh, say in the mirror of Benghazi to be looking into the VA. So hopefully they'll work with this. And you know, there's a point made uh, last night. It's an unclassified point made in a classified briefing, and uh, you know having to do with the prisoner exchange. But it is Congress is here as a you know as as a branch of government. We're Article One. The executive branch is Article Two. We have significant value and consulting with the executive branch on producing the kind of solutions that we need to be working together on. So that, that this administration doesn't have much history of that. And by the way, that point was made by a Democrat. Uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful mm-hmm. that that can happen, but actually I don't expect it to. 